Dr. Welcome. We don't get any more straight science than talking about Diomedes uh, auklets. And hopefully we do have a caller on the line. I don't know. Is the caller from Diomede? Where would the caller be from? It's, it's blocked out from me. I can just see we have a caller. Hopefully from one of our communities. But if not, we're glad from wherever they're coming and know that if you have questions, um, I will always go to the caller first. If the audience is unfamiliar with Zoom, you can go down to the bottom bar and you'll see a um, little bubble. And right now, at least at my end, it has a number one in it, but it's a little bubble, looks like a cartoon voice and it says chat. So you can click on that and you can tech, or type and it'll be like a little text box and I'll see that and I'll be monitoring the questions and um, we will get around to them, your questions and comments to Hector. So with that, um, in 2015 and 2016, the Bering Strait was experienced part of the Bering Sea heat wave that was coming up from the south. And Hector was on Diomede studying the auklets there. And he's gonna give us his um, findings of how, what was going on with the auklets at the same time that this bigger heat wave issue was creeping up on us from the south. So with that, Hector, take it away. So this picture is looking across, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to actually be Glad able to, to interact you. with Alaska, uh, and I do miss it. Uh, but anyways, this is looking across the international date line from Little Diomede towards Big Diomede Island. And if I had to give you a, a talk by a text message, I would just type out the message that climate change increases variances in marine ecosystems. Now, not everybody necessarily is familiar with what variance is. So I'll just say that variance is the uh, measure of variability. Uh, if we took all the individual values or observations and measured the difference between that and the average and then squared it, that would be our variance. So if our observations are widely spread out, that means that the variance is large. But if, if all the observations are clustered around the mean, the variance is small. If we wanted to know something about public health, we might use you know, information about samples that we collect. And in this case, you know, maybe it's blood pressure readings and how are those blood pressure readings distributed around a, a mean value. That might be a good index of public health. When it comes to environmental health, it's valuable to you know, monitor, monitor, monitor patterns of variation. This happens to be a, from a paper that talks about how salmon body size has gotten smaller. And th these data were put together based on you know, many, many years of observations and measurements. Now, for my research, I noticed an increase in variance in four key parameters. Temporal patterns, by temporal patterns, I mean the timing of natural events. Consumption patterns, I mean, what are the animals eating? What are the type, in other words, what are the birds eating? What types of foods are they relying upon? Where did those foods come from in the ecosystem? What is their relative trophic level? In other words, how high up in the food chain are those animals? Physiology, every organism, including the birds, has to maintain a, a, a steady state, if you will. And when we measure their response to uh, stress, for example, we're studying their physiology. And then trait expression simply refers to traits that we can observe in animals. In this particular case, I'm talking about traits that animals use to, and the auklets use to actually communicate with uh, their conspecifics or their fellow uh, individuals during the breeding season. Now, um, Diomede Islands are positioned at the northern extent of this very productive uh, ocean food web, a, a region uh, that is, has elevated productivity due to uh, a lot of nutrients. And there's uh, advection, which means currents carrying water, water masses and rich water masses up through Bering Strait. And the auklets are dependent upon this um, advected food web. 
Uh, without that advected food web, the, the, those very large numbers of auklets wouldn't be at the Diomede Islands, at least not as many. So auklets um, during the breeding season have a relatively limited, uh, by the way, right now what I see is um, the toolbar kind of at the top of the screen. Is that what you're seeing or not? Um, we do not see your toolbar. You can move it all around. You can cover your pictures. We won't see that. We're getting okay. Here. Okay, I'm gonna try and I think I'm gonna try and hide this thing. It is a little confounding sometimes when you're giving. Well, a I can I can work with I can work with it. It's okay. Just just know we don't see it. So wherever okay, you. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So anyways, during the um, uh, breeding season, the auklets, of course, are all located at colony, that means that they have relatively limited foraging ranges. That means that they're, they're actually sampling, if you will, the ocean. Instead of being aboard a ocean vessel, uh, I'm positioned within a ocean stream. The ocean is streaming by and the birds are going out and sampling the ocean. So um, that is a spatial sampling. And then the auklets have a particular foraging niche which integrates environmental inf information from lower trophic levels because typically they are specialists on zooplankton. Now, one of the first aspects that was really striking to me in uh, 2016 was very low colony attendance. This is on the Eastern side of uh, Diamond. Now in 2015, if you went over here in the last week of June, it was like going to the Super Bowl, but it wasn't just one Super Bowl. It's like seven Super Bowls stacked on top of each other. And it's just noisy as you can believe. So imagine going over there and then instead, instead of seeing wall-to-wall awkwards, you have just patches. I mean, it was, I've never seen anything like it before in my lifetime. I never expected to see anything like that in my lifetime. These birds gotta be, there by the last week of June, typically, uh, and ready to lay their eggs uh, in order to be on schedule. So my first thought was, wow, uh, did, you know, half of the colony just die? That was what, that's what I was wondering. I didn't know. I was just kind of baffled. I was wondering where the auklets were. And, it, and you didn't need to be a scientist either. People on Diomede, we're wondering, you know, where are all the auklets? And for that matter, the, the pilots that uh, drive the helicopter over with the mail, you know, they're fam familiar with what to expect and they're asking where, where are all the auklets. So didn't need to be a PhD to know there's a lot fewer. Now, of course, for me, when I go to survey a colony, I have a particular way of doing it. And so I can give you an estimate. And I was in particularly interest actually in trying to set up a long-term study. And so I was, uh, scoping out in 2015, essentially the whole colony trying to decide where would be the very best place for me to put plots. And so I was estimating what the densities were in various areas. And so that I had a really good feel for what should be there in 2016. And so it was markedly different. And the pattern was similar for least auklets, but I wasn't uh, trying to estimate least auklets to the same extent that, that I was crested auklets. Now, as you can see from this, this is showing anomalies in terms of sea surface temperature. The brighter, more closer to the red, the more uh, the temperature was above what the norm would be uh, based on a number of years of observations. And the darker towards dark purple, the cooler uh, the sea surface temperature would have been. So this was uh, anonymously high uh, sea surface temperatures from first week of July, 2015. Now, this is a publication uh, by Walsh et al. that appeared in the Alaska Bulletin of American Meteorology. Uh, no, excuse me, appeared in the uh, Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, but it was written about Alaska and the impacts of this heat wave. Now, the interesting thing was they talk about this ocean heat anomaly. If you remember, the blob actually was tailing off in 2015. And so, the interesting thing was that even though you might not have expected 2016 to be really hot, it turned out to be really hot. The atmospheric conditions were, were uh, just so that the 
a lot of the heat that was in the ocean was transferred northward uh, through the eastern uh, Aleutian area there and into the, into the Bering Sea. So this is showing you the, that ocean heat content anomaly. Now, this isn't my work. This is, of course, the work of these atmospheric scientists. And then this is a, a little graphic that Rick Tolman put together for me. Nice guy, very helpful. Always, always a pleasure to chat with, very knowledgeable guy. Anyways, he put together this heat map and this is showing you if you were to take 2015 and subtract it, what would be the excess temperature? And this is just July, okay? So we're looking at differences in mean sea surface temperature, right? So again, where you see trending to the red, you're looking at hotter than 2015 by how much? And it could be, depending on how red it is, it goes up to about 3.5 degrees Celsius above you know, what it was in 2015. So there you see is that there was intensification of this heat wave uh, in, uh, from 2015 to 2016. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is consumption patterns and variances in the consumption patterns. I just need to explain a few things about isotopes because maybe not everybody is familiar with isotopes, or, but in some cases, maybe I'm just reminding people of what they, that they know. So atoms, of course, are the basic, most basic unit of uh, matter, right? And so atoms can occur in more than one mass because you have these subatomic particles known as neutrons and there's a relatively few percent atoms that will have an extra neutron in the core of the atom and so if we're talking about carbon most of the carbon atoms have um, six neutrons and six protons in their core but there's only about a percent that actually have an additional uh, neutron nitrogen even fewer than a percent have an extra uh, neutron in their core. So the ratios of these heavy to light, if you will, uh, isotopes in tissues provides information about diet and environment. Now, when I show you this little Greek letter del, uh, it's, it's essentially referring to a ratio, a ratio of the heavy atoms to the light atoms. So Del 13 C, del 13 carbon refers to the ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12. And del 15 N refers to the ratio of heavy nitrogen to light nitrogen, that is 15 N to 14 N. Now, this is showing you the pattern of stable isotopes based on red blood cells collected from crested aquas during uh, 2015 and 2016. This axis on the vertical side, the left side there, is that del 15N, right? Ratio of heavy to light nitrogen. And then on the horizontal axis, we have the del 13C. So ratio of heavy to light. Notice that for 2015, there's a relatively small cluster of uh, data points. There, there are those blue triangles. Whereas if you compare that to 2016, it's spread about three times the area uh, on this uh, nitrogen versus carbon plot. So what this is showing us is that in 2016, there was a larger variance in stable isotope signatures. Now, one of the interesting things that was observed by Diomede Islanders, some people from Diomede that made a trip in late June over to Wales is that there were these large aggregations of crested aquas along the mainland coast near Wales. It's not something I personally saw, but they told me about it because at that same time, we wondered where are all the crested aquas? So very large numbers of crested aquas over along the, main, the mainland. And some even resting on the beach was something I'd never heard of, never observed before. Uh, typically you expect the uh, crested aquas to be you know, in areas of sheer uh, water uh, force where you have a lot of um, 
you know, features that help to concentrate zooplankton, for example, at fronts and so forth. So typically you would see the crested auklets foraging in offshore currents and waters surrounding the Diomede Islands. Um, those, those water masses uh, adjacent to the coast typically aren't, aren't carrying the types of prey that crested auklets prefer. So that unusual pattern that we saw with respect to uh, the stable isotopes may indicate that the birds were foraging differently in 2016. As you can see, uh, there were higher DEL-15 nitrogen values, uh, suggesting, uh, indicating, I think, that they were foraging at a higher trophic level and possibly also nutritional stress. Um, and then the, the, the lower values in DEL-13 carbon, I, in, I interpret that as less enrichment from that advected ocean upwelling. Okay. Now, least auklet showed a, a similar pattern. In the case of least auklet, I was collecting the growing primary feathers, just the very tip of them. And so they had lower del-13 carbon, uh, carbon values, like the, like the crested auklet, and higher del-15 nitrogen. So again, suggesting perhaps less uh, access to the enriched carbon from the upwelling and uh, perhaps feeding at a higher trophic level. Now, this is showing you uh, a trend in DEL-13 carbon uh, with Julian date of sampling. No trend, of course, for DEL-15 nitrogen. Now, why is this important in terms of the crested auklets? What I suspect this indicates is that uh, there was some access to upwelling coming along later in the breeding season. So, Date of sampling had a stronger effect here in 2016 than 2015. There was a pattern in 2015, but just not as strong. Now, I've been talking about why I interpret DEL-13 as an indicator of access to upwelling. And remember, I've talked about this uh, advected food supply. And my reason for interpreting DEL-13 as, as being related to this has to do with some other data that I collected at an earlier date where I was looking at zooplankton from crest, uh, from crest and lease auklets. And what I noticed is that regurgitations, they, they do these regurgitations to their chicks. Um, generally, DEL-13 carbon was high regurgitations that were dominated by the ocean zooplankton, that is associated with this advected anadir water, and lower in uh, regurgitations that had uh, less of the oceanic zooplankton and more of the local production. So that's why I, that, that I they do that or why I have that interpretation regarding DEL-13 carbon. So there was this very increased variance in um, the isotope patterns, the patterns of consumption. One thing I need to mention is that mo oceanographic models of uh, the northward flow through Bering Strait emphasize the importance of ocean bottom pressure. And so if you look at sea level pressure, and again, this is something that Rick Toman nicely put together for me. Uh, if, you, if you look at ocean bottom pressure, sea level pressure is part of the equation that makes up ocean bottom pressure. And here we see differences in terms of sea level pressure. And, and again, an anomalies, departures from an average that ran, ran from 1981 to 2010. And you can see in summer 2015, uh, roughly positioned over the east, Eastern Siberian Sea during summer 2015, you can see um, a lower sea level pressure. And so this would be consistent with this model that says that uh, when you have a lower ocean bottom pressure over the Eastern Siberian Sea during summer, you have you know, more northward flow. Contrast that with summer 2016, you don't see the same pattern. So this could be contributing to this. And of course, um, these characteristics are of course affected by climate, but obviously this is something that's relatively complex and I'm sort of not exactly in my bailiwick when I start talking about this stuff, but it's, it's interesting to see that there's this difference. All right, now I talked about uh, increased variance in temporal patterns, increased variance in consumption patterns, and now to talk about physiology. So corticosterone is a 
what we, what we might call a stress hormone. It is uh, secreted by birds and it helps them to mediate stress from the environment. So it could be metabolic needs, it could be environmental cues, other types of stressors, even social stressors that impinge upon, you know, sensors in the central nervous system, including the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And you have this cascade of biochemical reactions that end up causing the adrenal cortex to secrete uh, this, this stress hormone corticosterone. Now, what we see in contrast between 2015 and 2016 is that Cressoclids had higher baseline corticosterone in 2016 and also notice the difference in variances, the significantly larger variances in 2016 compared to 2015. So um, higher baseline corticosterone may be due to nutritional stress. Higher variances in baseline cort may be related in some way to the higher variance in consumption patterns. There was no relationship between Julian data sampling and baseline corticosterone in the 2000. 16 crested offlet. So data sampling did not have any effect there. Now, um, I also mentioned that there were increased variance in, in terms of trait expression. Or in terms of crested offlets, one of the things that's characteristic about crested offlets is they arrive at their breeding colonies in the northern Bering Sea with this very noticeable citrus-like odorant. And uh, people who have observed this, you know, say every year, uh, you know, the birds show up and, and they may have come from the south, that they may have just arrived, but you can smell it, okay? So in 2015, the citrus-like odor was strongly evident in the environment, and it was evident in the crested auklets that I captured up until July 30th. And that's not too far off from what you would typically expect in a, in a, in a usual year. Um, in 2016, the odorant was not strongly evident in the environment. It was not strongly expressed in most birds, and it was not evident in any of the birds I captured during the latter half of July. So here you have delayed breeding phenology, and yet the birds are either not producing it, or if they're producing it at all, it's shutting down sooner. Now, this is uh, simply a slide that helps to establish that crest, the crest awkward odorant is based on uh, fatty acid metabolism. That is, if you look at uh, the constituents of the secretory tissue that uh, produces, emits the, these uh, aldehydes, uh, you can see what looks like uh, you know, fatty acid sequential adding of uh, of um, acetic, the, the acetic acid type method of, um, of addition. And typically what, what you're looking at here in the upper right is one of these specialized structures that produce the aldehydes. What I found is that each one of these is, has a specific primary um, odor that it produces. So it could be the six carbon aldehyde, it could be the eight carbon aldehyde, it could be the 10 carbon aldehyde, that's predominantly what that, what that is producing. And then down below in the lower right-hand corner, you can see what are maybe not particularly well, but these are glandular cells. So if you smash one of these open, what you'll find is these glandular cells. So this is like essentially something like a gland, but it's, it's, it's kind of a weird structure. It sort of looks like a specialized feather with a hair coming out of it. Any case, the main point though is fatty acid metabolism is uh, implicated in odorant production. So if birds are not producing odor, then you know, maybe they can't afford to. And then this is uh, just showing you some work that was done not during my time at Diamede, but years previous. And it simply is showing that odor emission in Cressoclis appears to be linked to adrenal cortical function. That is, there's a link between glucocorticoids, corticosterone, which is you know, regulating how metabolism functions, and what amount of odorant is produced by, by birds. So the idea then is that physiological condition and energy balance may influence odorant expression. So if, if birds are, if there's a categorical difference in odorant production, then it suggests that 
uh, for some reason, the birds are impaired in some way or suppressing odor production. Now, um, one other interesting observation is that there was incomplete acquisition of uh, this bill pigment in 11% of the crested auklets that I uh, observed. So this distal part of the culmen towards the tip of the upper bill, that if you were, if you were following the phonology, this would be probably one of the last areas to actually get completely pigmented. And so that would occur by late April, early May. And I say that based on a study that I did with crested auklets and the Cincinnati Zoo, their captive population, where we documented the phonology of uh, pigment acquisition. And so this, this happens to be you know, early April and you're just beginning to see pigmentation in some of these birds and all the birds that we studied um, had uh, completed it by the end of April, first week of May. So the pigment molecules are secreted into the keratin, they're laminated there. And so the color that you see is based on these lamination of layers of layers. Now, I've, I've studied this pigment in a variety of ways and uh, it's fluorescent, it happens you know, to um, have some characteristics that are similar to some prey. So I think that uh, there's again, some tie into diet here. And if birds are not able to uh, fully color in their bill, if, if you will, it may be that they're limited in some way, either physiologically or diet or something else. But 11% of the birds didn't, didn't have a complete bill pigmentation. And that was not the case for any of the birds that I captured in 2015. All of them had complete bill pigmentation. So another contrast between 2015 and 2016. In a normal year, I would say, or an average year at least, most crested auklets, or at least some percentage of crested auklets, will have begun molding of flight feathers by sometime in July. But that was not the case in 2016 at all, and very few in 2015. So what that suggests to me is nutritional limitations uh, compared to some past years. So 2015, not necessarily a great year. 2016, though, considerably less good. Okay. Now, one thing I do need to mention, though, is that there was no difference in body condition. In, in birds, we uh, will look at mass, which is, of course, a volumetric measure. Or if you think about it, it's three-dimensional. And so we take three skeletal dimensions, multiply those together, and then divide the mass by that. And we use this as an indication of body condition or endogenous resources. So there was no difference in body condition between years. These birds weren't emaciated, they weren't starving. One thing to consider though, is that I think in most cases, birds need to acquire some threshold body condition before they can actually come into breeding condition. So the large absence of, of crested auklets uh, early in the season might've meant that some of them were still uh, trying to acquire breeding condition or acquire some threshold body condition. Okay, so now, so the contrast I observed in 2016 suggests perhaps there was a carryover or cumulative effects. We talked about these increased variance in these various uh, characteristics. We talked about how that was coincidental with uh, an increase in, in ocean temperature. And by the way, I've been showing you here images of sea surface temperature, but that paper that I referred to, when it talked about uh, ocean heat content, it wasn't talking about just sea surface temperature, it was talking about actually temperature at depth as well. So in conclusion, increased marine heat content was coincidence with increased variances in the marine ecosystem. In 2016, breeding was delayed for large numbers of crested auklets and least auklets at Little Dime Eden. This may have resulted in failure to reproduce. When you think about it, typically we'd say the population of either species that die need, at least in the past, was around a million. And if you think about anywhere from 35 to 50 percent being absent, uh, that is a you know very significant uh, absence. Now, several metrics suggest there were additive costs that negatively impacted condition and productivity. Crest auklets and least auklets are proxies for the marine ecosystem and other top predators 
may have also suffered impacts. So marine heat content in 2016 was the highest on record, but such events are forecasted to recur. That's not my statement. That's a statement from the, the paper by Walsh et al. So the limitations are, you know, this is primarily interesting from the standpoint that it contra is a contrast between two years. But the conclusions are limited. You can't determine a trend based on two years. Some of the data are descriptive. In some cases, sample sizes are relatively small. And this data were collected coincidental to the primary research. It wasn't like I had an idea, oh, there's going to be a marine heat wave in 2015 and 2016. No, I had, you know, completely other uh, plans instead. And this just sort of happened. I tried to cover it as best I could. So I would like to say thank you to uh, the National Institute of Health and uh, uh, acknowledge that their uh, funds help to fund this research, but they don't necessarily agree with uh, my conclusions or um, findings. And BLAST, of course, was the conduit by which the funds came through. I also would like to acknowledge the University of Alaska Foundation, Corey Joseph and the Kuskokwim campus of uh, UAF, Claudia Ill, Geisha Field and Northwest Campus, all of which were very helpful to me in trying to get this project off the ground, particularly in 2015 when, you know, you know, I was way behind the schedule that I really wanted to be on. Native Village of Diomede, which so graciously supported me in my work there, the Diomede School in the Bering Strait School District. Edward Sulik and many helpful people at Diomede. Uh, the Stable Isotope Facility at UAF. Erickson Helicopters. Steve Malowski in the Cincinnati Zoo, Rick Toman at the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. I also need to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Alexander Kataisky and uh, Evgenia Kataiskia, who did the work on the uh, corticostrum. Now, that was essentially what the talk was about. I just want to share a little bit of data because particularly if somebody there is on the line from Diomede, they'd probably be interested in hearing about this. My primary research was actually one of the, one of the projects that I was working on was um, survey of viruses in, in crested auklets of Diomede. And so because uh, Bering Strait is, is at this you know, important location where you have the uh, flyways of the Pacific and the, um, you know, Australasian and Asian uh, continents crossing over. It's, it's a potential gateway for viral exchange. So we uh, sampled more than 100 crested auklets in 2015 and 2016 at Little Diomede. And that's Corey Joseph, by the way, who worked with me at uh, Little Diomede in 2015. And we uh, use those samples in collaboration with Dr. Carlos Romero at the University of Florida. So he did sampling for avian influenza and also sampling for avian coronaviruses. Of course, at the time, I didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic. But uh, the interesting thing, uh, of course, is with avian influenza, there's a number of different subtypes. And so when you have these different flyways coming uh, together, there's a potential for uh, new subtypes to, uh, to, to emerge. And so we're interested in finding out, first of all, whether there was any uh, avian influenza in the crested auklets, and then what subtype would be present. And then with regards to coronaviruses, uh, these are, of course, avian coronaviruses. They're not necessarily infectious to humans, uh, although there's always that concern, right? But research had done some work in areas around uh, Beringia and the Bering Sea, and it found that uh, there was some coronaviruses that were detected in wild birds more prevalent than was previously thought. So we were doing the work on coronaviruses as well. So in terms of uh, our results with regards to the, the viruses, no samples tested positive for avian coronaviruses. There's a very low percentage of samples that tested positive for avian influenza, less than 1%. And then the work that uh, Dr. Romero still needs to do is retest samples to confirm positive tests 
If positive test results are confirmed, then we'll attempt to uh, determine what subtype of avian influenza was present. In addition to that work, I was also studying the bill pigment, but that's um, more than probably I should attempt to try and discuss tonight. So that's about it. So um, thanks for your attention. And uh, if anybody's there from Diomede, I hope that you were able to follow that. So thank you, Hector. And um, the caller did drop off. So I know we've, we, it is a heck of a hard thing to get a call and have it stay on for that long, but, um, but hopefully maybe they'll try back again. It was nice to have a caller. Um, so thank you, Hector, learned a lot. And, and for those of you that don't know when Hector described, you sort of took me right back when you described the odor, the smell of the crested auklets on a calm night like a, a beautiful summer night at Diomede, there is a, just a, a light citrus smell because you're surrounded by the birds, light, beautiful citrus smell. And Hector's done a lot to um, uh, let people know what that, your research, let people know that that help, is helpful to the birds, but also interesting to me. So you're saying that that is also related to fitness. Yeah, well, so that's- bird might put out more. Right, you, there's, there's differences in terms of, uh, there's individual differences in terms of the odor and emissions. But um, in, in this particular case, it was muted in 2016 compared to 2015. And it was, you know, I was looking back at my notes and I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, at one point in June, I realized, you know, I'm smelling two of these constituents, but I'm not smelling, you know, one of the ones that's really characteristic of, of what people relate to. There's a couple of markers that are that are very characteristic of that, that are familiar to people. And I wasn't even smelling those. And I was realizing, wow, you know, that, that at that point in June, I realized, man, you know, this this odor should be strong here. And it's just not. I'm barely smelling anything. So it was a very different year. 2016 is a very different year. But yeah, if they can't, if they can't produce the odor, the question is, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean for breeding? I, I don't think we know enough yet to say exactly what that would mean, except that, you know, it probably isn't good. <laughs> Something different. Yeah. So you, you, you do, so everyone who has, normally we take the caller first, but they're not on. So either chat in your question. There are questions in the chat I'll get to, or if, try to raise your hand or we'll get to you. Um, blurred in if, uh, if you need to. Um, so the first question is from Brian Himmelblum and he says, was the lack of auklet odorant production, that lovely citrus smell linked to changes in diet, i.e. lack of preferred high fatty acid prey species due to the marine heat waves disrupting the lower trophic levels in the Bering Strait? You know, it's, that's, that's a good plausible explanation, but, but I don't know. Now, um, by the way, I showed you uh, how I would like to measure odor and emissions, right? I showed you that, that little kettle, uh, and that's a really good way to quantify. And what I, what I did in 2015 and 2016 was just kind of, you know, descriptive. I wasn't taking any actual measurements. So it was, it was a categorical difference that I observed. Now, in terms of were they... I would love to know. I would love to know your uh, the answer to your question because I have done work with fatty acids uh, on these crested auklets. And what happened in 2016, you wish, you really wish you were lined up to actually answer that question. I wish that I was, uh, you know, doing some quantitative measurements of the odorant. And I wish that I was modeling diets with uh, quantitative fatty acid signature analysis. But as it so happened, you know, that circumstance comes along and you're not set up to do it. And so it's not possible for me to actually answer that question, but I think it's, uh, it's, it seems reasonable to me, particularly when you consider that, that change in terms of the carbon 13 and the fact that the, de the del uh, nitrogen was so different uh, I wondered actually whether they might be feeding on something entirely different than what they're characteristically feeding upon. Let's say, for example, those uh, crested auklets that were mounted up on the shore over there by whales, you know, were they feeding on 
some type of larva that, for example, they don't normally feed upon? Or were they feeding upon some type of, uh, you know, swarm of something that just happened to be there? And they were overlooking because they couldn't find their, their regular food. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea, that, what you said there. I think it's quite possible, but I don't know. And you have another question in the chat box that says, what are the daily diets of less of lesser, I think that's least. Oh, the least auklets? And crested during okay. pretty warming years in the Bering Strait. Like okay, so you're saying, I think, can you repeat the question just to make sure I answer it correctly? What are the daily diets of the least and crested auklets during pre-warming years in the Bering oh, okay, Strait? Okay, okay. So, when... so when they first arrive, in the in the spring, my sense is that they have to rely a little bit more upon foods like amphipods. And it's not clear to me, since I haven't been able to do extensive sampling, exactly when they start getting access to more of the oceanic uh, copepods. But in terms of the difference in diets between crested auklets and least auklets, crested auklets are able to take larger zooplankton and least auklets will take, you know, slightly smaller. Their least auklets are about a third of the size of a crested auklet. Um, at some point in a good year, they will start to feed quite a lot on juvenile uh, euphalsids. And those juvenile euphalsids get swept up from uh, the anadir area and they get transported northward. And so they just chow down on those things. And they'll do that both at uh, St. Lawrence and they'll do that at uh, Diomede. Uh, but in between those two, those two periods, then there's, they'll try to get as much of those large zooplankton as they can. But if they're not as plentiful, they'll end up eating uh, smaller copepods like Calanus marshalli. And the Calanus marshall eye simply are um, uh, what we would call bearing shelf water or more, more of the local production. So, and then, you know, they'll fill in with a, a number of other types of uh, zooplankton. Um, but, you know, they, they have the backup at, at, at uh, St. Lawrence where they have this extensive shelf and lots of, of um, amphipods. And my sense is, that they don't have that type of resource as much at uh, at Diomede. Diomede is doesn't have you know it's kind of out there. Doesn't have quite the shelf. But I found pretty interesting things off of Diomede. I think that, you know they they eat some of the same uh, advected food, but they'll also get some other things at Diomede. They might even get, for example, little Zoea crab, you know, uh, larva sometimes uh, things like that. So, but they, if they can get those big ocean zooplankton, that's, that's what they love. And if, if um, Oculus can get a hold of uh, euphalsids, they, they like that about as much as anything. They really go for the euphalsids. But euphalsids are fast swimmers, not easy to catch usually. So thank, thank you, Hector. And um, the, you have a question from Julia Lerner with the Gnome Nugget, and that is how might the warming climate, and, and I've also, um, well, how might the warming climate impact existing auklet populations in Diomede and on into the future? That's a good question. And that's what I've got scratching my head right now. Um, this, this particular episode that I witnessed, you know, happened to be a, a heat wave that there were special circumstances that set it up. And I hope there isn't another very soon. But what, what I would be concerned about is additive stress. So we saw that the birds were late in arriving, if they even arrived. And so what that meant was that probably a very significant percentage of the population had no chance of being successful reproductively. That was, you know, you write off 2016. If you're not there at the optimal time, uh, usually that's the way it's been, at least in the past, then, you know, you're not going to, you don't have much of a chance of being successful. And there's a number of reasons for that. Just, you just don't hit the right benchmarks in terms of raising a chick to, to the point of being able to fledge and being able to survive. 
And so what I would suspect is that you're going to possibly be in a situation where food resources are not as, a, as available or quality food resources may not be as available. And so you could begin to see, depending upon how many of these events get stacked up, you could begin to see additive stress that would potentially result in a change in the population. And you might see fewer of the birds. But that's speculation. I don't really know. It, it's certainly something that I'm concerned about. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so the auklet is a long-lived bird and can kind of take a hit occasionally. Is that correct? Like, well, all right, so this year was no good. So, well, all right, we're going to abandon the colony, ditch having an egg, go back and just concentrate on finding food because you know what? We're having a hard enough time with that, but we're going to be around next year. But I guess what I'm hearing you say is like that is the bird is long lived, but continually adding stress at some point, even a long lived bird is going to be like, hey, you know, year four, I'm still not laying an egg. I'm, you know, I'm whatever. Is that so well, eventually? Here, here's what I would say. Let's suppose that, that you have them. You, you're, 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 you're correct. You're correct. That's exactly that's exactly right. But I'm thinking about in terms of probabilities and I'm thinking about the population scale. So let's say if you normally would have a million crested auklets at Diomede, but instead you have like half that number that show up on time to breed. Um, that means that, you know, maybe half the population has a chance of being successful. But in actuality, maybe the overall reproductive success is as low as 0.3 or 0.25. In other words, you only have maybe a quarter of the pairs that actually show up on time that actually successfully fled to chick. So you can begin to see what happens in, if you're thinking about probable, probabilistic uh, outcomes that over time, just on the population level, the, the likelihood is that you're gonna have fewer, fewer offspring successfully uh, you know, get to fledging. Now, one of the things that I can't say anything about is what happened in the winter time between 2015 and 2016. That's a, you know, that's a really open question, I have no idea. But you know, I'd have to think that that wasn't, a, that wasn't a great time to be a crested auklet in the Bering Sea, right? Or for that matter, any place I would think, but I don't know that, but I would well, think it would be tough. Since your, your sojourn on Diomede in 15 and 16, and then 17, since 2017, when race division, NOAA race division came up and sort of painted us the picture of what had happened, the thermal barrier was gone, obliterated, separating the Southern and Northern Bering Sea ecosystems, completely distinct ecosystems. In 2018, 2017 was warm, we had trouble. 2018, though, it was very clear that there was no more physical barrier separating two ecosystems and all the large predatory fish came up like Pollock on mass. I don't know if you've heard about that. And then the Pacific cod came up on mass. And we've since 2017, we've annually had multi-species seabird die-offs. The thought was maybe these birds are, are in such poor body condition because of a harmful algal bloom poison. Maybe there's a disease event going on. And Last year, I think all the results came in and last fall, USGS, Caroline Van Hemert gave a presentation that said, you know, we didn't get high HAB results. We didn't get disease events. And so it looks like the birds were failing. I think if you knock out disease and you knock out harmful algal bloom poisoning, it seems food availability would probably be a logical conclusion. And I know you haven't been up here, you down in Louisiana, but know that it's been a tough time. But there is some good questions coming in in the chat. And that is, um, there was one, have there been any reported periods of normalcy in the subsequent years? Or are the numbers on diamide of the auklet still low? See, that's a good question. I don't know. And see, right. from my standpoint, what, what I was comparing was, I was at the at the island for the same periods of time uh, during 2015 and 2016. So I could see a clear contrast between 2015 and 2016. 
Before that, I'd only been to Diomede once before, right? And that was years prior. And I'd been trying to get back for a very long time. And I would have gone back in 2017, except for, you know, the things that were happening with the university and the disruption that occurred and that. So I haven't been back. So I really don't know. I mean, I know what a what an Auckland colony would typically look look like, right? And uh, because crested Auckland's, for example, are very gregarious, they tend to nest in in clusters, if you will. Nobody wants to be out there by themselves. And so when you see what looks like you know Swiss cheese in a colony, you know that that doesn't look right, right? And that's what it was like in 2016. But I would hope that after that extreme you know, marine heat content passed in 2016, I would have hoped that things would have, you know, come back a little bit to a more corrective situation and maybe you would see better uh, reproductive output and greater productivity, but I don't know. So that's, that's um, interesting. And I think that the managers for seabirds is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So maybe for some of the people asking questions, maybe that's something I can follow up with and see if there's any uh, information regarding the Auckland colonies, colony on uh, Diomede. My other question was, you know, St. Lawrence Island is another, Matt has another several beautiful colonies of least and crested auklets. And on both islands, they're an important uh, subsistence resource. Is there been any I have not, I do not know about the auklets. Um, oh, there's... There, there, there was a much better study done at uh, St. Lawrence over, over multiple years so that they could actually draw trends. And uh, it was during some of the same period. And I don't think they saw, now, now mind you, I don't know that they were looking at anything in terms of uh, attendance. In other words, were birds in attendance have has the population uh, declined or anything? But there was there was a good study that was published, and that was by uh, Katayski and uh, some of his colleagues. So th that that work was done well. Now, one of the things about St. Lawrence, as I mentioned, is even if that infected stream isn't so strong, there's such a broad shelf at St. Lawrence that, to a certain extent, it can be compensatory because you can have some local production there. It won't be maybe as high octane, if you will. It's not high octane like those zooplankton coming uh, from the uh, Bering Sea Basin, but it's, it's uh, you know, you can subsist on it. And so the birds can get by on, on, on various types of amphipods and other things that are there on that shelf. So it might be a contrast between, and that's one of the interesting things that, that I think would be good to do and what I tried to start doing some years ago is to try and look at uh, a comparison between Diomede and St. Lawrence but I you know I, I had like a couple of years where I got some samples but I didn't get as much done as I as I had hoped to do uh, due to lack of funding but you know it's something that would be interesting to uh, follow up on and by the way of course there's King Island just uh, not far away from Nome where crested auklets also nested uh, historically. And I think some of the questions that, that we're having might also pertain to uh, King Island as well and how the crested auklet colony there is doing there, which you know I've heard from time to time is maybe not so good. All right, any other questions from the audience? Type them in, ask them, and let me just do a check to see if our caller came back. No caller. All right. Um, well, for the audience, please remember that it is not easy to be a straight science speaker and it is not easy be, to be doing a presentation starting at 930 at night on a weeknight. So I want to, um, if you want to write in, put some love for Hector there in the chat box. He deserves it. Or people are clapping. I don't know if you can see well, that. Well, thank you. Thank I thank everybody for uh, coming along and uh, really enjoyed uh, the, uh, I'll take a look at some of the things that people put in here. I'll send them to thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, um, well done.
So thank you all for coming next week at um, uh, next Thursday, we have Dan Rizzolo and he will give be giving a presentation on his loon research. He did research on three species of loon, red throated um, Pacific and yellow billed and up in the Chukchi Sea coast. So maybe Hector, um, we'll see you in the audience. Oh, I would love to. I love, I love loons. Uh, loons All right. Well, great, you love great. loons. Next okay. week's um, presentation then is for you. And thank you, Dan. Uh, he's a,